the moment I even look at a community, the establishment promptly reacts in fear, shock, hate, and uh, begins to uh, engage in a campaign of vilification, denunciation. Since the community, the, the have-not community, the one that, that you are interested in, sees this reaction, they're imme immediately they assume that uh, they haven't seen anybody so shake up the establishment. This is what the establishment fears above everything else. It must, ipso facto, be good and be what they want. Uh, the establishment's reactions or action immediately induces a reaction in the community where they start organizing to bring me in, you see. The fact that they have sort of, they, that they buy a good deal of the mythology that this guy is sort of a demigod or a superman and always wins his fights, etc., is extremely important too because remember here, here's a people that are starting uh, believing that there isn't anything they can do about anything. They're almost beaten. The whole issue of organization is the, the instilling of a little bit of hope and faith that through their own strength and organization, they can move and do something. So on top of this, when they have the feeling of, he's with us, this accelerates organization. You follow me? Yeah. yeah. As members of the company, we're paid a very minimal wage, and uh, I gather your fees are somewhat other than minimal. How do you feel about this poverty type of, of your, yeah, of wages uh, being paid to people? Do you think uh, there's any use? I in think that? that's no, I don't. I think mm -hmm. that's just a reverse public relations jazz that isn't kidding anybody. If I've got good organizers, I've got to pay them well, and furthermore, I want to pay them well because uh, they have enough domestic domestic tensions without the financial situation coming into it. Now, uh, uh, and furthermore, it is understood by the people we're working with that, uh, you know, that if, if you're good at your job and you're regarded as a professional, uh, this question doesn't come up. Yeah. The two very basic differences between um, what you're doing and what all of us are doing in our own areas. First of all is that uh, we're a lot younger than you are. And that there isn't in this country a real tradition of organizing of any kind. Well, no, there was a time when I was about your age. Yeah. And I was in this work then. Um, and that when you talk about um, going in and strength and using your myth, um, some of us have been invited into communities what happens to us when the, the press comes in and various things like that is something quite different than what happens to you because our myth doesn't exist. Um, that in fact the people in the community believe the press and believe those people in the community who may have a uh, tendency to distrust in other situations when they call us all the things that they call us. Um, partly because of the fact that we're students. But that points into something much deeper, and that is that um, you talk about United States and you talk about conflicting groups with an awareness of that kind of conflict. And in one group, the have-nots, um, a potential, if not a real, anger under the surface. So that when you go in and get um, attacked by the establishment, everybody in their heart says, aha, that must mean that there's something good about him. But in this country, um, you don't have that kind of separation, and you certainly don't have that underlying anger, and you don't, I don't think, have the objective conditions of closeness of people and um, obviousness of, of problem to create the kind of situation that you're talking about. You have a much more scattered situation, much more scattered problems um, being dealt with in much less obvious ways. Um, so our situation is quite a bit different than the one you've been describing, I think. Well, your situation will differ in terms of the intensity of coloring. But basically, the pattern of the picture is the same. And so we, we come up against two questions. Um, 
related ones. One, what do you destroy in organizing them to fight with the American or white or Canadianized, uh, on the Canadianized terms? What do you destroy about the culture that exists there and about the kind of dignity that they have, which is a different kind of dignity than the one we're talking about in a white community? Um, and if, in fact, you're destroying a Mexican-American community in order to organize it um, to fight, um, you know, power with power, um, maybe one of the ways that you might work instead of organizing is to leave it disorganized and protect it in other ways that, um, I'm not sure how to make this clear, that, that um, you may find that in order to get flush toilets in a community, you destroy something worse to the people there, no, a great deal more no, than flush toilets. And um, that that's the dilemma we've been in, partly in this country, and the other dilemma we've been in is in terms of uh, how do you organize in a rural community where no one admits to being poor, and, and is quite, quite concerned about that. Well, in the first, you, uh, you're, you're going to be in a dilemma because everything in life is a dilemma. Everything in life is a series of, uh, uh, I'd say, a confrontation of contradictions. You're going to pay the price for whatever you get. You will pay it individually. You commented many times, uh, in, at least in your written material, about the fact that change, the process by which change takes place is almost equally as important as the change itself. That, for instance, people getting things by their own efforts is much better than people, you know, being given something. Well, if, if that's the case, then is it not so with a community? And I'm not now talking about uh, that morality which one legislates, but I'm talking about the behavior which simply is, that the style with which one organizes a community may so completely alter the social fabric of that community that it simply won't be worth whatever changes uh, might be gotten. You mean uh, the style will so completely alter the fabric of that community? Let's get away from just a diffused generalization up on top. Uh, let's get back to a simple on the floor. When you make a statement, produce the evidence on it, you know. Uh, Give me an example of what you mean. Well, you, you say, for instance, that uh, democracy consists of struggle between power groups. Uh, that dissonance, for instance, is the music of democracy, I think, yes, is yes, one yes, of the yes. Well, now, in, in some communities which are still small enough, not, not now the large ghettos, but small communities in which people can have daily face-to-face -face confrontations, where people because of their style of life, will not make decisions for other people, where everything is still done on an old-fashioned town meeting basis, where everyone really is involved. This, this then becomes a little bit different than the, uh, the style of, of vested interest power groups sort of knocking heads against each other. One other uh, question which is not allied to that is one of your other quotations, uh, which I like, is about sit-ins, which you say sit-ins are now obsolete because they're a part of the experience of the power structure. Now, I'm even granting the uniqueness <clears throat> and the element of surprise which you bring in. When will the methodology of Alinsky become a part of the experience of the power structure, and, and when will it then be obsolete? Oh, it, uh, a lot of it has already... Uh uh, become part of their experience, but uh, uh, some of it they have a great deal of difficulty coping with because it's based on ridicule, and uh, it's pretty uh, it's uh, pretty tough to break out of a pattern of where you are being ridiculed for precisely what you are. Or the same thing when uh, when I'll make the statement that. One of the most effective tactics is making you live up to your own book of rules. They've got to live by their own book of rules. But sooner or later, many of these tactics uh, do get within their experience. All tactics will eventually, but then you constantly have to develop new ones. That if an organizer like yourself came in yeah. with a style of organization which at least is recognizable, it might become a handle on which the establishment can get a hold and begin to use that community. 
And this is why I'm wondering if it... Well, I mean, for your styles of, of organization with getting groups together, getting committees, of uh, having no, leaders... Hand, let me point out to you, as far as a style of organization, uh, uh, the styles are very different. Uh, there isn't any such thing as, as a style except in the imagination of the opposition. Uh, and this style happens to be what is current. Well, we probably work in more diverse situations politically and uh, sociologically than you do. We have people who are, who are working in, in hippie communities and it doesn't, you know, the different kind of people have to do those different kinds of tasks. And, uh, you know, what kind of role should they have when they go in there? What kind of relationship should they have with the community? How difficult really is entry into a community? Suppose that, um, that you go into a community, you're invited in there by some, some organization, which is part of the social sector and you get there for two weeks and you, and you see exactly what they are and you don't want to work with them and you start working with, with, with other people who aren't organized, well then, since you don't have an invitation, but that really increases your problems of entry into the community. Well, this comes back again to the fluidity that is necessary. You've got to be almost a, an utterly unstructured, unstructured person, you know what I mean? Now these are very rare and tough to come by. When we, after we go through a careful process of selection, then put them under training, then we have a 70% washout after that. And of the 30%, I'd say 80% can, can only get up to what we would call a secondary level. But the kind of organizers could develop in the staff directors, project directors, and so on, the kind that you say, go to Buffalo, start organizing, and so forth. Now, the selection of an organizer is, is uh, more or less uh, done like the selection of, uh, I suppose, of uh, uh, take a crude analogy, like the Major League Baseball Club looking for its, uh, its, ta its players. Uh, we have always looked to the sand lots. We assume that anyone who is an organizer, who has the potentials of being an organizer, is being driven by a dynamism of anger against injustice in this broadest sense, as he sees it, against inequities and so forth. And that this anger is a, uh, is a deep one. And a person who has that is not one who is content to either just uh, discuss it or abstain from action. He's going to pitch into action on, in his own way. He may bungle around and bitch up the works, but he's going to go into action. So the fact that people are sincere, uh, dedicated, committed, uh, uh, all the, uh, this other stuff uh, doesn't matter a damn, you know. And this comes to the heart of your question on One, whether he has a very high level of intelligence. That's one. Two, whether he is, uh, whether he's doing this on a personal ego basis, of course this ties in with some of the other things you're talking about, purely for a personal status, or whether he's, he's really committed on this. Uh, three, whether he can understand uh, the differences, and this is one of the big things in, in training of our organizers, between the world as it is and the world as we would like it to be. Whether he understands such simple things, that in the world as it is, that the right thing is practically always done for the wrong reasons. Uh, and a whole series of other criteria, so we can discuss later if you want to. Uh, he has got to uh, be able to uh, grasp universality so that he has a pattern, because when I say a pattern, and certain goals, because you're quite right. There is nothing that is more killing in terms of the sheer monotony and boredom and lack of drama than day-to-day -day organization. And uh, organiza much more organizations done by your ears than by your tongue. Uh, 
And you always have to have that goal up ahead, as well as that driving anger, to know why you're organizing in this seemingly dull, monotonous day, and tomorrow's monotony, and the day after tomorrow's monotony, are part of something very dramatic for the future. Almost you might call it having a vision, so to speak. But it's that anger that keeps him moving on it. He has got to... Uh, uh, to... Uh, be free of any dogma, always questioning, always challenging. I would say that the characteristic of a, of a reverence and of a non-acceptance of any sacred cows is a basic element. Now, this is a far cry from just a guy who's smart alecky and stuff. Let me suggest, too, that, there, that the actual training has to be done in the field of action. Uh, you just, uh, you can only understand so much in terms of reading or in terms of even discussions on a verbal level. The whole teaching program is a very, very uh, subtle and uh, complex operation and highly individualized. But if you start off with the, uh, with a uh, selection which is not uh, the kind that I've mentioned, then I don't give a damn how much teaching you're going to throw at them, you know. You're, you're just not going to be able to train organizers. A good many of the things that you, I think sometimes you call them universalities, but I'm wondering if sometimes they aren't assumptions, uh, on which you base your activity, uh, you get into a situation where you have almost self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, one assumption that you make is that change only happens as a result of threat. Uh, this being so, you then organize yourself in terms of... Or controversy. Or controversy, but you, you then organize yourself in terms of one power group against another power group, the stronger the better, and, mm -hmm. and you win a battle, more or less. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you, you, know, no. you speak in almost military war terms. No. Well, uh, this is all based on the fact that a threat is necessary, and without this, uh, you won't have this self-fulfilling prophecy. You tell me anything that ever came out in the story of man that was not in response to a, uh, to a threat. Well, I'm not as familiar with the story of man as I am with my own life. And I, I know that, you know, changes that have taken place in my life, and I'm, I'm sure changes in yours, have not always been on the basis of threat. That sometimes it's on the basis of just common sense, or just reason, or just desire, without any, any threat being involved. Well... I don't know your life. I, uh, let, let, let's assume, let's assume, just for the sake of your own discussion, that this may be so. And there are, there are exceptions to every rule. In the world as it is, that your evaluation on a course of, of action, or even on values itself, is always on the basis of alternatives, not as you would like to have it done. But if you don't do this, what are your alternatives? That in the world as it is, that response always comes, always in, in response to a threat. Now, when I say threat, I mean threat of physical violence. Could be a threat of physical violence, but generally a threat of a rearrangement of a power pattern whereby they're going to have to give up more if they don't give up something at this point. And that conception I have of, of the world is sort of a, as mankind sort of going up a mountain. And there's a certain summit that he's struggling for. And on, on that summit, by the time he gets up there, he's got to go through over all kinds of obstacles on war and prejudice and famine, unemployment, uh, all the things we regard as evil. And finally, he's going to make it up there, I think. I know he's come a hell of a long way, because even with the gas ovens and everything else, when you look back, we've come a long, long way. See, one of the... One of the, I don't want to get into a long philosophical discussion, but you're giving a, a 19th century notion of progress, and progress is a mighty hard, long road to hoe. And, you know, in terms of your example about the mountain, that there's this summit that man's got to get to, you know. No. That they, you know, he's got to go through all these struggles to get there. You know, there's a group of people now who talk about abolishing the mountain. Yeah, uh, well, you see, they're, you know, the world, they're, they're social change, talk. no, social change is not just, you know, advancing and developing in certain points up a mountain that you've defined as the mountain and there's now, a summit. this is the 19th century. Well, okay, yeah, call it 19th century notion of progress, you oh. know, what it is philosophically. The, I, the, the, the important thing is that 
that social change means changing the world. Mm -hmm. That is. That's what social change you, is. You, that it's not a unilinear line that always reaches for the summit of the mountain. Uh, well, well, now, wait a minute. That line, the I give, it, give it impressions leading up to that mountain, it's so goddamn detour all around the place. I know, but you're still going. You still want to be well, up I, on I, the I, summit I, of that mountain. Well, I've, 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 I've got to believe he's going to get up there, because if I don't, what the hell am I crap? I believe he's going to destroy the mountain, and that whole struggle won't even be meaningful. Now, I've been doing stuff for seven years. All right, now, but, I haven't but, got a TWO to my credit, all right, but, why, but I seek a transformation of society. I don't seek to keep sending people up the mountain. And blowing the mountain is not copping out. It's not copping out? No. Where the hell are you blowing it? You change it. You just don't have, you don't ask How people. How are you going to change it? You don't it? ask you, people. You, you, you don't say, this is man, therefore you're going to do it, because this you, is man. You, you this the, is is. I decided you, you, this you is is. You talk about blowing up the mountain. It's just a, a pile of words. Well, going up it is just the same pile of the words. The hell it is. It isn't, huh? No, it isn't. You're organizing the poor for what? To get participate in these decadent, decayed, degenerate, bourgeois values. Well, when I talk to the poor, when they ask me to work with them, you know what they want? They want a bigger, fatter piece of these decadent, degenerate, bourgeois values. All right, this may be wrong, but this is the Of course the they want that. That's what the media has taught them to want. That's what the whole socialization process is about. Of course. All right, you want to go organize them on other values that you have decided are better values someone, for them? I think there's someone here who works with a group of people who are operating on different values. You mean the hippies? The hippies are the first ones who try and live in a new value system. They're the first ones who actively deal with the problem of utopia. They don't have to write about it, they don't have to think about it, they, they try and live it. They try and live their lives as they want them to be in a new society. Look, you've had hippies from the time the, the world began. At one point, the desert was so goddamn crowded with hippies to, uh, during the early days of Christianity that people started climbing, uh, went back to the cities and started climbing uh, uh, up to mountain cabins to get away and to live their kind of life. You think this kind of withdrawal and this kind of, all right, I will go live my life I'll live it and hit Asbury, or I'll become a Trappist monk and I'll live it over here. Yeah, okay. So and, and, you th and you think that that is being people... Let me put this I mean, to let you. Me, let me, let me. But one of the major theories of social change is that you build up counter-institutions to what is, well, and that well, a new society right. emerges. Right, I mean, how the hell did Christianity right, develop? Right, what's right, the, what's the development of capitalism? Oh, well, no, it's the same minute. thing. You don't have a tougher, harder, more realistic operator than Paul in organizing Christianity. If Paul hadn't come around to organize a Christian church, Christ would have been another guy hanging oh, on a cross. There's there. always the organizers. I'm not saying there isn't the well, organizers. He was the guy who But I'm did saying it. there's a different set of values that no, grow up love, alongside but another but love, alongside another when you when you when you start organizing and you start organizing like a guy like Paul, and you can see you can see his reports coming in from his organizers. They call them missionaries. I got a bunch signed up here. They're all ready to buy it, but they don't want to be circumcised. They say it hurts. Skip, skip the circumcision. I got another group over here. They're all ready to come in, but they don't want to give up uh, lobster and seafood and so forth, which is against the Mosaic law. <coughs> the hell with that. Drop that out. Sign them on. You can see this guy organizing and dealing all over the place. As long as you are not organized, you will never have power, which is... I repeat, the ability to act. Don't look at power in an, an invidious context with all of the emotional uh, sordidness of conspiracy and negativism and, and corruption and so forth that most people uh, associate with it. It's simply the ability to act. It's my heart pumping the power in my heart to keep me alive. It's actually the life force itself. As long as you don't organize to have that power, you can have... Uh, 1% of the people of this world, let's say the bastards organized, and all the rest of the world hippie, and that 1% is going to run the whole damn world, you know? Isn't that what's happening now on the basis of power organizations? One of the reasons, yeah, but you know why it's happening? Because the kind of people you're talking about have dropped out. This is the cowardly way out. As far as I'm concerned, if there is such a thing as a judgment day, which I seriously doubt, because I just, because if there is, Jesus, your first question to, to St. Peter is not don't ask me how I've been behaving, you know, how many, what, what happened to your marbles, really, in terms of the world, uh, what's happening down there. But if there is one, and a, so and a, and a guy who has his marbles, and a trappist uh, comes up there, or a hippie, 
And, and he says, what the hell have you been doing all your life? He says, well, I've been living up to my values. Well, what have you been doing as far as other people are concerned? All the, all the suffering here and this and this and so forth. Well, I've been setting an example or, you know, I'm, I, I, I don't want to... I don't want to fight the mountain. I don't want to climb it. I want to blow it or something. Oh, for Christ's sake, what kind of a character have you got here? There are ways of running away. There are ways of running away. And, and running away means you're running away from the real world. Now you're going to criticize them on the basis that they're not defining the world in the way that you define the world. No, I'm not. Particularly in your world, you see things as, you know, having beginnings and ends and preferably organizers for those beginnings and ends. Well, look, I don't know how the hell we're even communicating, because I just don't understand what the, world, what the hell this world is you're talking about. Well, I understand where your world is, and I admit that it exists, but I, I'm just asking you to make room for my well, world, too. Well, I'm making room for your world. No, because you say things in terms of universalities, which aren't, just don't happen to be in my world. Things like, you know, existing on threats, on power, and so on. Now, those aren't universalities. Those are things that do exist in some situations. I'm saying, well, let me ask you this, a very simple one. Uh, do, you, uh, do you accept the fact that in the world as it is, uh, that a prime moving force on the part of human action is self-interest, as they define self-interest? In some situations, yes. In some situations? In some situations. You were describing, for instance, the There's resistance of uh, people who were... That's right. You know, how, and there are those who would push that and turn it into self-interest on the basis that they, they were holding that position because otherwise others might squeal. They were setting a pattern. But even, and I'm not including them in that pattern. But those are the rare exceptions. There are always exceptions. But they're so damn rare. When I'm talking about a universality, I'm talking about generally across the board. Uh, I, but this I is something, incidentally, that no political philosopher or, or political observer has ever disagreed with. Even in our own Federalist Papers, with a big difference between uh, well, Madison and Jay and Hamilton, they, they agreed on that one. Now, the fact that, you, you see, the, your hang-up is this. The fact that one uh, starts with the world as it is does not in any sense vitiate, dilute, or negate, or weaken one's desire to change it into the kind of world you would like it to be. But you're never going to change it into the world that you like it to be unless you start with it mm -hmm. from where it is. But maybe your hang-up is that you see my world as being a hang-up. That's true. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs>